Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 16. That's how I should begin. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16 if you're not already there. Uh, that's where our scripture reading came from, and so you may already be there, but uh, we'll spend all of our time there together. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, we'll begin in verse 21 in just a moment. But I do want to ask you as we, we begin, has anyone here ever been to Yellowstone? I see a couple of hands and a couple of head shakes. Uh, one of the most memorable events or trips or periods of my childhood was when we took a family trip to Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone is an amazing place. It's far from here, I'm sure, because it was far from there, and I think we were closer uh, than where we are here. At the time, we lived in Bakersfield, California, and I know it is about a 17-hour drive from Bakersfield uh, to Yellowstone, and back in 1986, which is hard to say, 35 years ago or so, I think is when we went as a family, and I'm sure it took a little longer than 17 hours with three kids uh, in the back seat of a car and uh, the way things were that long ago. Uh, we packed into our Toyota Camry, which Toyota Camrys were much smaller in 1986 than they are today. Uh, I don't think they were fit for a family, but uh, we crammed in the back, and my sister, who's older than me, who was here last week, sat by the window over there, and I sat uh, by the window on the driver's side, and my little sister, who's eight years younger than me, sat in a car seat that was crammed in the middle of, of that uh, back seat of the car. It was one of the greatest trips we ever took, at least in my mind, one of the most memorable trips we ever took. It was on that trip as we were driving home that I looked up out the, the back window, which was directly above me in the little back seat of that car, and I saw our luggage begin to slide off the luggage rack. Uh, there was no room in the car, and so my dad loved to put luggage on top of the car, not something we do so often today. And uh, he loved to invest in bungee cords, we called them. I think that's what they are. And just strap everything down with these elastic cords. Well, we had a playpen for my little sister that would unfold. And I remember looking up out of that back window and seeing the hinge of that playpen begin sliding down the glass. And I, I think it was etching the glass as it went. And I knew something was wrong, okay? I was young, but I knew something was wrong. I tried to tell my parents about it. And they sort of just dismissed me, you know, who, what does this kid know? Keep driving, looking at maps or whatever we did in 1986. And then every piece of luggage flew off the back of the car. Uh, I remember my dad was very upset, <laughs> was very upset. Uh, we pulled off the car or pulled off on the side of the road. They collected the luggage. They strapped it back on the top. We got all of our luggage, but we joked for years that, you know, if you need a playpen, there's one on the side of the road in Wyoming somewhere. We left that uh, for the state to take care of. Uh, if you've been to Yellowstone, that's not the point of my lesson at all. That's a lesson for another day. But if you've been to Yellowstone, it is truly an amazing place. You can watch geysers uh, of uh, almost boiling or boiling hot water you know, shoot hundreds of feet into the air. Uh, you can fish in beautiful rivers and lakes and catch uh, rainbow trout and brown trout and other sorts of fish, which is what we did while we were there. Uh, the entire time you're in the park, you're just surrounded by wildlife. Every night while we were there, if I recall... Uh, we had a cabin among a group of cabins, and bears would come through that camp and disturb things, and we thought that was very exciting. Beyond that, wherever we went, it seemed, there were bison. We didn't call them bison. We called them buffalo, but I think technically they are bison. But they would be in parking lots of you know, the store or the visitor center. Uh, they were in meadows off the side of the road. And then from time to time, they would be right in the middle of the road. I remember one night, my dad and I were heading back to our cabin after fishing on a lake, and the sun had just gone down. And as we came around this curve in the road, there was a huge bison standing right in the middle of that road. I can almost see it like it was yesterday, uh, this double yellow line with a bison just straddling it there in the middle of the road. And that bison took up all of the road, probably 1,500 pounds or so. My dad slammed on the brakes. We stopped our Toyota Camry. We looked at that bison, we looked at each other, the bison looked at us, and all we could do is wait for it to move. We couldn't get around it, it took up all the space there was, uh, we couldn't go through it, that would be dangerous of course, and so we waited for the bison to move, and eventually it did, and eventually we made it to our cabin safely. That bison stood in our way. That bison was an obstacle that prevented us from going where it is that we needed to go. And spiritually speaking, there are moments in our lives 
when a bison is standing right in the middle of our path, right in the middle of our road. Spiritually speaking, there are moments in our lives when we can't go any farther until that obstacle gets out of our way. It blocks our route. It, it, it stands between us and where we need to be. That obstacle might be another person. It might be some physical temptation in our lives. It might be ourselves at time that is standing in our own way. It could be any number of things. And in Matthew chapter 16, the text that was read for us, Peter is the one who's standing in the road. Peter is the obstacle, and it is Jesus who absolutely knows exactly where he needs to go. Jesus knows where he needs to go. Jesus knows that the reason he left heaven was to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus knows that in order to complete that divine mission he's been given, or in order to save the lost, that he needs to live a sinless life, and that ultimately he needs to give that life on the cross. Jesus knows. He doesn't have any question, any doubt. Jesus knows where it is that he needs to go. And in Matthew chapter 16, we're going to back up just a little bit. We talked about this last week, and we've talked about it before. But in Matthew chapter 16, he's there with his closest disciples, and he asks them, who do people say that I am? He starts a conversation wondering, what is the buzz about me? What, what do the crowds say? Who have they determined who I am? And, and those disciples answer, and they say, well, some say John the Baptist, uh, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And so Jesus then hears that answer, and he turns to those disciples directly, and he asks them, but who do you say that I am? After all you've seen, after all you've heard, of all that you know, who is it that you say that I am? And we remember it's Peter who spoke up first, right? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now Jesus knows. He knew, of course, the answer before Peter gave it. He knows that Peter now understands. Peter understands. Peter has the courage to say out loud that he believes that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed of God. That he believes that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. That he believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And we remember that Jesus then praises Peter for that confession. And he tells him, upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it or shall not prevail against it, as some translations say. What a wonderful confession Peter has made. And Jesus praises him for that confession. He tells him that faith that you have now confessed before all of us is the very foundation that my kingdom will be built upon. And we know that kingdom is the church, that confession of faith. It seems in the text that all of the disciples who were there, it wasn't just Peter who was there, but they're all in agreement. If we skip down to verse 20 of chapter 16, Jesus warns all of them, don't tell anyone that I'm the Christ. And they don't argue with him. It seems that they've all come to, you know, as Peter said, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. They all said, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I agree with that. And so Jesus says, keep it to yourselves. Don't tell anyone. We know the time has not yet come. And then the Bible says in verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Now that he knows that they know, from that moment, Jesus begins to teach them something new. He tells them that he must go to Jerusalem. That's where Jesus needs to go. He tells them that he must suffer many things, that he must be killed, that he must be raised on the third day. That is what Jesus came to do. That is the divine mission that he has been given. And now that the disciples understand that he is the Christ, again, after all they've seen, after all they have heard him teach, Jesus is leading them to the next step to understand what has to happen, what must happen, what needs to happen next. Jesus knows exactly where he needs to go. Jesus knows exactly how important it is, but then we see that it's Peter who's standing in the way. In verse 22 of chapter 16, the text says, Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now this is the boldness of Peter that we remember. This is the, uh, the courage of Peter 
that we remember. He is the first to admit you are the Christ. You are the, the son of the living God. And he is the first to pull Jesus aside and rebuke him. To rebuke is to strongly or harshly correct. And that's what Peter does to Jesus. It's never going to happen. God is never going to let that happen. And, and we might even get the sense as we read that passage that what Peter is saying or what Peter is meaning is I'm not going to let that happen. I'll never allow that to happen. I'm going to defend you. I'm willing to die for you. It's not much later in Matthew chapter 26, hours before Jesus is arrested and put to death, that Peter uh, absolutely disagrees that he would ever deny the Christ. And he says, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And we know that Peter was wrong in Matthew chapter 26, don't we? We know that Peter did deny the Lord, that Christ was right all along, and just as he was wrong in 26, he's wrong in Matthew chapter 16. It probably sounded like a very faithful statement as those words came out of Peter's mouth, as he, he formed them in his mind, as he spoke them before those other disciples. It might sound like a very faithful statement to us as we read this text this morning. Again, Peter is bold and Peter is courageous and Peter seems to be a man who is absolutely fearless. But the problem is Jesus knows where he needs to go. Jesus knows what it is that he must do, where he must go, what he must endure. And as faithful and as obedient as Peter might be or appear to be, in reality... Peter is that bison standing right in the middle of the road. Peter is standing in the way of Jesus. He's standing between Jesus and the cross. And you know, I think back to that, that night as we came upon that animal there in the road, that bison did not understand enough to know that we had somewhere that we needed to be. That bison didn't understand enough to know that we had somewhere that we wanted to go or needed to go or, or that our cabin was over there and, and, and you're between us and our cabin. He didn't know that he was standing in our way and I think the same is probably true of Peter. He's now tempting Jesus to abandon his divine mission and Peter surely doesn't understand that. He's tempting Jesus to stop what needs to happen. What Jesus says must happen. I must go to Jerusalem. I must suffer many things. I, I must be killed. But Peter is saying very clearly, very adamantly, strongly rebuking Jesus, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to allow it to happen. In our lives, I wonder if we can think of anything that is standing in our spiritual path. Or maybe think back to a different time in our life when something was standing in our spiritual way. Is there anything in our lives that tempts us to stop doing what it is that we must do? To stop being faithful to God? To stop being obedient to God? And the question, or the answer to that question, needs to be absolutely yes, there are things that do that, right? We live in a world that is, surrounds us with temptation. There are all sorts of things that get between us and heaven throughout our entire spiritual lives. Anytime we give in to temptation, Anytime uh, we fail in sin, we have failed to obey God. We have failed to remain faithful to God. But what if we get a little more specific in our lives? Is there anything in our lives that, that tempts us to perhaps stop attending worship service or stop attending Bible study or, or, or to stop opening our Bible throughout the week and, and reading and studying and bearing the word of God in our hearts? Is there anything in our lives, maybe more specific than the world in general, that we can think of that, that stops us from getting down on our knees and praying to God? Or fill in the blank with whatever your struggle might be. Is there anything specifically in our lives that stops us from doing whatever it is that we know we should be doing spiritually? Can we isolate those things? Can we say, that's the thing, that's, that's the one right there, that is what causes me to stumble. That thing right there, whatever it is, that's what causes me to stumble time and time again. That is what's standing in my way. And if I don't do something about it, I may not make it to the end. I may not make it to my goal. I don't know what those obstacles might be in your life. Maybe it's something, uh, some specific desire or some specific temptation that seems to trip you up spiritually over and over again. 
Maybe it's some relationship or friendship that that we know isn't helping us spiritually. Maybe it is our job or a hobby that we have, something uh, something that we we use to take up our extra time, but it takes too much of our time, pulls us away from God instead of drawing us closer to him. If we can figure out what it is that's standing right in front of us, And if we can remember what it is that we must do, if we can remember what our mission is or where we're headed or where we need to go, then maybe we can do what Jesus does with Peter. See, Jesus knew where he needs to go. Jesus knows now that it's Peter who's standing right in the way. And so Jesus moves Peter out of the way. And that sounds simple, doesn't it? Jesus moves Peter right out of the way. Jesus doesn't change his plans and come up with some alternate destination and say, well, you know, Peter was right there, so I guess the cross has to, you know, go on the back burner for now. Jesus doesn't stand there and just hope that eventually Peter will, you know, decide to move on his own and just wait for that to happen. He doesn't accommodate Peter, fearful that he'll hurt his feelings or discourage him. Jesus does what needs to be done in order to move Peter out of the way or to get Peter to move out of the way and stay focused on his goal. In chapter 16 and verse 23, but he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And I hope now, as we've gone through this passage of Scripture, as we've, as we've thought about this, as we've studied this together, I hope this verse means more to us now, or we have a better understanding of this verse than we might have when we began. Jesus refers to Peter as Satan, and we know who Satan is. Peter knew who Satan was, but we know that Satan is the tempter. If we went back to Matthew chapter 4, just after Jesus is baptized, he goes out into the wilderness and he is tempted by Satan himself. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3, the text says, The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Jesus is saying, You are now the tempter. You are Satan. And it's not that Peter is now possessed by the devil. It's not that Peter has literally transformed into Satan, but Peter is standing in the path. Peter is blocking the path. Peter is standing between Jesus and his cross. Peter is doing, unbeknownst to him, the terrible work of the devil. He's tempting Jesus to fail. He's tempting Jesus to change his course or to fail in that divine mission. And it was a temptation for Christ, make no mistake. Christ was tempted throughout his ministry, throughout his life on earth. It wasn't just in Matthew chapter 4. Christ was tempted as he hangs on a cross, and he's tempted here as he stands before his friend Peter. Jesus wasn't looking forward to being nailed to the cross. Jesus wasn't looking forward to suffering or being rejected by the people or being uh, put to death on that cross. But Jesus knew better than anyone else that that is exactly what needed to happen. He knew better than anyone else that that is exactly where he needed to go. In Matthew chapter 6, in that Sermon on the Mount, he, he tells the people, the crowds of people, he tells even us today how we should pray to God, and he says in that, that, that model prayer, your will be done, speaking of God the Father. Your will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. In Matthew chapter 6 or 26, he's there gathered with these same disciples and he prays again to God, your will be done. He's speaking of the will of God and the will of God is that Jesus would live a perfect life and give that life on the cross for the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus knew what he'd come to do. Jesus knew that he had come to do the will of his father And now Peter is standing in the way. Peter is tempting him to change his plans. And so Jesus moves him out of the way. Get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Again, can we think of anything in our lives that is standing between us and eternity in heaven? Maybe there are physical things. Maybe it is our job. Maybe... It is relationships that we have. Maybe it's just things that we hold dear in our lives. Jesus told Peter, your focus is all wrong. 
You're focusing on this physical world and physical problems. You are making, Peter, you're making physical plans instead of focusing on God. Maybe it's not physical, tangible things. Maybe it is spiritual things. Maybe temptation is what stands between us and the cross or us and eternity in heaven. Maybe it is us constantly giving in to that temptation or regularly giving in to that temptation. Maybe it's struggles that we have. Maybe it is worry in our life or fear in our life or a lack of faith in our life. Spiritual things might be harder to put our finger on and say, that's it. That's the problem. But those things can easily be just as much or more of a distraction than the physical things. You see, all of us are going to face obstacles in our lives. I think we probably do most every day. And most of the time, those obstacles, they really don't cause us much of a problem. If I'm driving home after services today and there's a sign that says detour ahead, it takes me a few more minutes to get home. If I go to Food Lion, as I have gone several times in the last couple of weeks, with a grocery list in hand, and, and I'm looking for a gallon of milk, and it's simply not on the shelf, I don't know why, but it's not, well, I'll still make it through the week. We'll still be okay. But when it comes to our salvation, and when it comes to our souls, when it comes to our eternal home in heaven, when we come to an obstacle in the road, when we come up on that bison standing right in the middle of our path, or when we come upon someone like Peter, who is tempting us to change our course or change our destination, we can sit in the car like my dad and I did. We really didn't have a choice, just hoping that that thing, whatever it is, will move out of the way. But instead, we need to handle it like Jesus handled it. Jesus knew where he was headed. Jesus knew what the obstacle before him was. And he knew he needed to do whatever he could to move that obstacle out of the way. I don't know what your need might be this morning. But this morning we offer the invitation to anyone who might need to respond. If you have never obeyed the gospel, the Bible teaches that when a person hears the word of God and they believe it, when they're willing to obey it by repenting of sin in their life, turning away from that sin and turning toward God, willing to confess the name of Jesus before men, that is to confess out loud that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Bible teaches that person can go down into the waters of baptism and have their sins washed away. If you haven't done that, we invite you to do that this morning. The Bible teaches that when a person comes out of that water, they are added to the body of Christ. They are added to the church by the Lord himself. They be, become a Christian and a child of God in that moment. If you haven't done that, again, we invite you to do that today. Maybe you have been baptized, maybe you are a Christian, but you have sin in your life. Maybe there is that bison standing right in the middle of your path and you have never moved it out of the way. If you have sin that is public in nature, it might demand a public repentance. We want you to repent of that sin. We want you to pray to God for forgiveness and let us pray with you and let us pray for you. Maybe you have another need completely of this congregation, whether it be the prayers of the congregation while we're gathered here or any other need. We hope that you'll make it known. Come forward while we stand, while we sing our invitation song.